Hello, I'm Bob Challoner, the President and CEO of Southampton Hospital, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Focus on Southampton Hospital, your monthly program about the people, the services, and the events at your local community hospital. Today we have a program where we're going to introduce a new, uh, a new service at Southampton Hospital, a cardiac catheterization lab, and I've invited our two newest uh, cardiologists, Dr. Travis Bench and Dr. Deval Patel, who will be speaking about this new program and are leading our efforts to bring this service to our East End communities. A vital new program. Many of you have probably heard about cardiac catheterization. Today we'll be talking about the service, what it is, uh, what it isn't, and timing for actually making this service available in, in Southampton. And before I welcome the doctors, uh, little bit about what we're doing. It's a, it's a program that is, uh, will be opening in our Audrey and Martin Gruse Heart and Stroke Center, um, utilizing our state-of-the-art hybrid operating room where we will be able to do these procedures with the help of the two physicians you're about to meet and a team of people at our friends at uh, Stony Brook University Medical Center. Um, the program was approved this spring by the State Commissioner of Health um, and we are underway to staff it and, and get the program in place and we hope to be doing our first cardiac catheterizations in August of this year. Um, so before I go any further, let me just welcome our two doctors, Dr. Patel and Dr. Bench. Thanks. Welcome, thank you, doctors, thank you, and you. thank you for joining me not only today but joining our community out here. Um, you were both opened a brand new cardiology practice here uh, with Stony Brook in, on County Road 39, you know. Um, and as is my custom, before we talk about the clinical program, tell, tell me a little bit about yourselves, um, how you've ended up out here in the East End and, and your training and background. And I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Bench. You're an interventional cardiologist. Um, can you tell us, tell us what that is and also a little bit about your background, how you ended up in the field and why cardiology? Sure. Well, I was a physician assistant by trade first okay. and went back to medical school as a second career. Great. Um, fell in love with the field of cardiology and after my medical school um, at Stony Brook and residency training at Columbia Presbyterian in the city, Great. I came back to Stony Brook to pursue a, a fellowship in cardiology. And after graduating from that, pursued a second fellowship in interventional cardiology also at Stony Brook. So interventional cardiology is a subspecialty of cardiology where we deal uh, largely with the management of cardiac disorders through um, catheterizations that okay. are performed in this catheterization suite. Which we'll um, be learning about today. Absolutely. In the show, right? So, most commonly, we deal with blockages of the coronary arteries um, that could precipitate either angina under stable conditions or heart attacks, which um, be, can be a very uh, detrimental effect of, of, of coronary artery disease. Okay, great. Thank you very much. How much training was that altogether? I'm always. Uh, I'm always impressed with how much training doctors have been through. 15 years. Wow. Four years of medical school, three years of medicine residency, three years of general cardiology, and then fourth year of cardiology, uh, interventional cardiology. Wow, very impressive. And I know, Dr. Patel, you've been through similar training, but yeah. tell us about yourself so also. My medical journey started in 1995, wow. um, back home in India, where I, fin I had intense interest in uh, basic science research and right. uh, clinical research. So, during um, my basic science uh, year, I started uh, getting involved in uh, some clinical, uh, uh, seeing the patients, and I decided to pursue my career in medicine. I came to United States and uh, joined St. Vincent Hospital in New York City. Uh, right. That's where I had my internal medicine training. During my training years, I had a, a great uh, pleasure to work with some of the renowned, uh, renowned cardiologists, um, and so uh, developed my interest in cardiology. I finished my cardiology training at St. Vincent, I also did international training in St. Luke's. Um, currently, I'm uh, practicing more preventive and um, imaging cardiology. Um, right. But uh, my interest is uh, preventive cardiology. That's where you know we're trying to prevent as much as event we can, right. and uh, imaging and uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, we both of us are working together for the last five years. Five um, years. Wow. My, I have a family out in Suffolk County. My wife grew up in Suffolk County. After okay. finishing my training in New York City, we decided to move back to Long Island and okay. uh, pursue my further uh, career and job in um, Suffolk County. Um, we always love it when the spouses talk the doctors into moving out move here. Back, that yeah. helps us in our recruitment. So, um, Well, thank you. And the preventive side of it we'd like to talk about also because mm -hmm. that's really where we, mm -hmm. where we would like to be. Um, and um, 
I'd like to just start off a little bit about cardiac catheterization and uh, a term that many of us are familiar with um, as lay people, but um, we may not really be that, that familiar uh, with it. So could you just describe what is a cardiac catheterization and what's, it, what's its function? Well, there's a, there's a lot that can be involved in a cardiac catheterization right. and we tailor the procedure to the individual needs of the patient, basically. So in a general sense, cardiac catheterization is any kind of study of the heart or the, the blood vessels of the heart um, through catheters that we string through the arteries of the body up back to the heart. Okay. So, I mean, in a, in a very general sense, the heart pumps all of the blood out to your body through the aortic valve into the aorta. And if we can work our way back to that area via an artery in your body, um, via catheters, we can assess these arteries or valves or the function of the heart itself. So either through a arterial puncture through a femoral artery in the groin or through the radial arteries in the wrists, sometimes the brachial arteries in the arm, we can string catheters back to the heart and assess um, whatever we need to about the function of the heart. Of the heart, okay. And what is, we talk about this catheter, what is, what is a catheter? What, do, what does it look like exactly? So right? catheter is, is a plastic tube that okay. uh, uh, in order, um, what we do is to, first of all, in order for us to go up and put a catheter into your heart, we would like to um, numb the skin, make a small needle puncture hole, put a plastic tube, through that we can put another catheter that goes, travels through your artery into your uh, aorta, and then okay. we, um, so ultimately heart is a muscle, and in order for muscle to contract, it needs oxygen and oxygen is provided to your heart through these two, three arteries, uh, they, they call coronary arteries, that one on the right side, two on the left side, that uh, comes out of the aorta. So we travel through the arteries, uh, put a catheter into the aorta, and we have, uh, we inject the dye, the contrast material, into that coronary arteries, and we have x-ray camera, we take a picture in a different, different angle okay. to make sure um, in order to find out the blockage, to see um, atherosclerotic process, plaque buildup, to see if, you know, if it needs to be addressed with the medications or a balloon or stents. Okay, so t um, typically, when would you do the procedure? What's, uh, I mean, I know we always have the image of the person walking down the street, suddenly clutching their mm -hmm. chest, falling to the ground, but I know it's, that's actually fairly rare, my understanding, mm -hmm. uh, but what, what, would it, what would trigger you as cardiologists to say it's time to well, time again, to undergo this procedure. As the field evolves and as the field already has evolved, the indications for this continue to grow. Okay. So if you look at the very first case reports of you know cardiac catheterization, they were just assessing pressures inside of the heart for okay. diagnosis of various illnesses. Um, not, not looking for the blockages or anything? No. Okay. Not and it later days, involved, it evolved to begin to look for blockages that at the time were only treated with bypass surgery. Okay. And so as you can see, we've advanced along that lines to right. the point where nowadays we're actually replacing valves right. of the heart, not even dealing with blockages in the arteries, through um, balloons and, and, and artificial valves that are placed through a catheter. So again, the, the indications for cardiac catheterization can be very, very broad. Okay. In the most common form, um, we deal primarily with blockages of the coronary arteries, okay. um, which is a process, again, that produces chest pain and angina pectoris, um, but at its most extreme can cause heart attack and sudden cardiac death. Okay. So um, not to intentionally um, uh, I guess walk around or skirt right. your question, right. but really it's a procedure that's tailored to the individual patient. We can okay. deal with anything from heart failure and a loss of function of the heart to complex valvular disease um, to putting in stents in the setting of a heart attack. So it depends. And the cath catheter itself, um, somebody said, oh, it's a little camera. It's not really a little camera. It's absolutely certain, not a right? camera. Okay. The camera, so the camera that we camera. use okay. is a, a, a fluoroscopy basically camera that we move around the body in different projections right. to obtain you know, a visualization of either the heart function or of the arteries itself in order to determine what the correct treatment would be. Okay, and the catheter is uh, injecting dye or mm -hmm. other, other things like the valves that you're placing mm -hmm. in the Absolutely. heart. Absolutely. So it's, it's my way of transiting whatever it is I want into and out of your heart. Okay. Sometimes the catheter I am using just to assess pressure measurements in different chambers of the heart or lungs. Okay. Other times I can transit stents in and out of there over a wire. Um, so again, 
The, the catheter itself is simply a, a tube, which I use as a tool to um, perform procedures on the heart, whatever that may be. Get to the inside get without outside. opening. And the tube has a hollow lumen, so that's where we can inject whatever we want to inject, like a dye. Okay. And uh, we can also pass a small wire through the, that lumen okay. and uh, cross the blockage and right. use the balloon to crush the blockage and uh, expand the um, area and then put a stand if we need to. Okay, and it's, um, there must be different types of catheters then. Are you sometimes literally changing catheters in the yeah. middle of a procedure? Yeah. So. Absolutely, depending upon you know, right. what, what we're, we're using or what the needs are, the right. catheters can be changed, uh, again, to fit the individual procedure. And I've mm -hmm. heard the terms diagnostic and interventional caths. Um, what mm -hmm. is, um, what's the difference? Why, why would we do uh, one? Do we actually use it just for diagnosis sometimes? You're not actually doing anything other Absolutely. than... Absolutely. So the, fir the first... I guess you're doing something by diagnosing. Yeah. I should be clear on that. But so, like, yeah. so cardiac catheterization is an invasive procedure. Okay. Right. So um, although we're not opening up the body and we're not trained as surgeons, um, make no mistake about it, um, entering into somebody's heart with the intention of either obtaining pictures or performing an intervention is something that we take very seriously because there are complications. Right. Every test that we do in the office as non-invasive cardiologists, we do in lieu of an invasive procedure such as catheterization. Okay. And therefore, we have to understand that most of those procedures have um, certain sensitivities right. where where they're comparing it to the gold standard, which is a, a, a cardiac catheterization. Well, that was going to be my question. Why can't you just take a picture, take an x-ray, and see the blockage? Yeah. What's it's, the, yeah. Because, because largely we're dealing with a risk and benefit, okay. right? So when we do non-invasive testing, the risks are very low, and we can obtain the information without pe putting people in harm's way. Mm -hmm. Once we've achieved enough information on non-invasive testing that suggests that we need to take a step further, and although we assume a greater risk of doing the <coughs> procedure, we may be able to provide more benefit, mm -hmm. okay. then we would proceed with the catheterization. Okay. And every catheterization, um, begins with a diagnostic cath, mm -hmm. okay. where you obtain information and then, depending upon what needs to be done, act upon it, okay. at which point we would talk about an interventional procedure. Okay. So before we perform any of this testing, whether it's a non-invasive testing or cardiac catheterization, having a detailed clinical history about patient's symptoms, right. risk factor will help us to decide what kind of test we want to pursue. We have a facility both in the hospital and outpatient that we can perform various kind of testing that includes the echocardiogram, stress testing, and also other tests to diagnose them to see if they have a coronary artery disease. Um, so clinical history by you know looking at the risk factors and event, we decide whether this patient needs to go for stress testing or they have to go directly to the cardiac catheterization. Um, if some of the patients who require a cardiac catheterization, um, they need a pre-testing. Okay. Um, we want to make sure the blood work looks good, make sure they don't, they're not anemic. Right. Uh, because since we are giving them a dye, we want to make sure they have no proper, no any allergy you know, to some dye. Some people are allergic, right? So is we right? pre-medicate them for the dye allergy. Okay. Uh, we also need to know their kidney function. Okay. Because if the kidney fun we are giving them a dye, dye can sit in the kidney and can slow down the kidney. So we would like to know the kidney function. And sometimes if we have a borderline kidney function, we also involve the nephrologist to help us out to pre-medicate them and follow up afterward if they need to follow up the kidney function. And this is a procedure. Um, right. it's, it's, not a, it's not a surgery, but still it requires the same uh, kind of pre-procedural uh, screening, fasting um, night before. And um, you know when they come, we do some or other IV line to set them up and get the consent and all the stuff. So we decide this like need for the procedure, whether stress test or cardiac catheterization dip, depends upon different different data. Um, I know like many procedures um, in, in healthcare, typically innovations start in the large academic medical <coughs> centers and eventually reach a point where we mm -hmm. can bring them out to smaller smaller hospitals like Southampton <coughs> Hospital. And, and all procedures, as you both have pointed out, are, are risky. Anytime we do mm -hmm. anything, there's a certain risk. Um, what do you think is the major reasons why suddenly we're seeing this procedure being able to be done in a community hospital? Have we, have we crossed a threshold where Absolutely. the risk is such that we, the advantages, I guess, are, are more better to be able to bring it closer to home? That's, that's a great question. And uh, I mean, thankfully, the answer is, yeah, we can do a lot more. So, you know, traditionally, um, 
putting in stents and, and, and doing these, these kind of procedures were done in only larger academic centers. Um, unfortunately for the American population, um, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer. Right. And, it, and, it, and it is by a large margin. And when we look at um, a, a big reason for mortality in America, it's from heart <laughs> attacks and sudden cardiac death. Right. And there were large studies that were done several years ago that basically showed that having the facilities to perform an interventional procedure on somebody having an acute myocardial infarction or a heart attack um, reduced mortality rates from, from these events. Right. And it was at that point that these studies proved that doing these procedures in the absence of cardiac surgical backup were safe. Okay. And it was at that time that we saw a boom in these community cardiology programs. Now there's still certain limitations to what we can do in a cath lab without having our surgical colleagues immediately available for our backup. Right. But any time in medicine that you can prove an absolute mortality benefit for something, it's a procedure that we need to disseminate. Right. And, and as it stands, when somebody has a heart attack, the most important thing is how quickly you can get that artery open. Right. And in the majority of the parts of the world to, the, to date today, they do that with intravenous medications that dissolve the clot. Right. Um, and uh, these thrombolytics, they're called, um, are still being given today right here in Southampton right. because we don't have the facility as of yet. Right. Um, and so the ability to bring a more definitive therapy um, to anybody, uh, right. to be honest with you, uh, is, is an important step. Um, we're, we're directly impacting mortality from the most common uh, cause of American mortality today. And certainly given our geography out here, we're in somewhat isolated peninsula and the travel times to from mm -hmm. here to Stony Brook, which is sponsoring our cardiac cath lab. I know that Stony Brook agrees and you two have both been advocates for moving the program closer to the population on the South Fork, particularly when we see our huge <coughs> summer surge in the yeah. population. Um, so certainly it seems to, to make sense. Why, you talked about the, the, um, the, the drugs, the clot buster drugs. Why isn't that enough? Um, the research shows that basically um, there's about a 15% failure rate with thrombolytics. Okay. And so again, when you're talking about um, the difference between life and death, right. um, a 15% failure rate in my it's mind is unacceptable. Too high. So those are patients that if you're administering these thrombolytics, these drug or the clot busting agents, they would still need to be immediately transferred in case there was therapeutic failure. And that's where this geographic limitation really comes into play um, because then you're talking about either the need to fly somebody depending upon the time of year, the traffic, or they could be sitting in an ambulance for two hours trying to get to Stony Brook. Right. So mm -hmm. um, again, heart muscle does not regenerate. When right. that artery is closed, that muscle is dying. That's the pain people feel in their chest when they're having a heart attack is actually okay. the death of their heart muscle. Right. The sooner that I can get in there and open it up, the better the outcome is going to be. And introducing or allowing for there to be delay is unacceptable. To get the blood flow back to it. Now, talk to me a little bit about open heart surgery. We will not be doing open heart surgery mm -hmm. here. That's a procedure that rightfully belongs in the major academic medical centers. Um, the days of, uh, yeah, I, I remember the days when bypass was the standard, standard of somebody. Uh, it seems like, is, is this replacing a lot of the bypass surgery? And when, when does somebody still need to go on for open heart surgery? So, um, in the old days, bypass was the only treatment option when you have a blockage and needs to be opened up. But with the new advancement in the technology, now they were able to put the stand um, for the cardiac catheterization to fix the multiple blockages. At the same time, they, they even with the recent advances, they they can even change the aortic valve and you know balloon the other valves if they need to using a cardiac catheterization. Right. Those all these treatment options were only you know kind of available for patients who require a bypass surgery, but in um, with the new advances in the recent treatment, they can do all these procedures, including the multiple blockage fixing, the valve replacement and valve balloon, just from going from the groin or going from the wrist and they can fix it. In recent, with the last 10 to 15 years, number of the bypass uh, procedures went down with the recent, all this uh, new technology available for uh, cardi with the cardiac catheterization and also new stent technology, they can take care of all the blockages with the angiography and angioplasty, you know, then going for traditional bypass. In order, also bypass is an invasive procedure that requires multiple preparation, including 
we want to make sure patients are have a good lung functional, they have to have a good functional capacity in order for them to come out of the bypass and come out of the ventilator. So with all these new advances in the uh, last 10 to 15 years, more and more patients are going for cardiac catheterization, angioplasty, than bypass. Cardiac, cardiac catheterization is, is obviously a very good procedure, and it has impacted um, rates of coronary artery bypass grafting, but there is still a definitive role for bypass surgery. Well, that was going to be my question. Yeah. Yeah. I know that it's, it's still done. When do you decide that it's so, still... So everything that we do through that catheter depends right. upon me being able to put a wire right. through the blockage. It depends on me being able to open up that blockage with a balloon that's inflated at, by myself at the bedside. Okay. Um, coronary artery disease is a process that creates an incredible amount of inflammation within the arteries right. and our bodies treat inflammation by calcifying these okay. lesions and so if you can imagine moving a rock with a balloon is not always possible right. so there are certain people certain patients um, who have coronary artery disease that is either very very heavily calcified or the lesions are not amenable to what we call PCI percutaneous coronary intervention okay. um, it is for those patients that CT surgery is the preferred revascularization um, procedure. Um, and even within this, there is a certain um, consultation between cardiac surgeons and cardiologists about right. what patients may benefit be uh, the most from different procedures. And again, you know, this program will be um, heavily reliant upon consultation with other cardiologists as well as cardiac surgeons at Stony Brook. Um, the images that we obtain here are going to be directly visible by uh, my colleagues at Stony Brook. Um, certainly, you know, we are not going to be operating on an island, so to speak. Right, right. Um, we are going to be uh, in the care of many other doctors at Stony Brook as well who have also joined a uh, relationship with Mount Sinai in the city. So right. this is really bringing a full, um, you know, a, a full gamut of consultative cardiology to Southampton. It sounds like it's truly a team effort, and I know the two of you mm -hmm. are both on faculty at, at Stony Brook, and uh, we're, we're meeting just the two of you, but there's an entire team of cardiologists, yeah, and some of the others will be rotating, rotating through here So as this well. new cat lab will be staffed by right. some of the cardiologists from Stony Brook and also right. some of the nursing staff who will help us out to build a program here. That's right. Because it's pretty new for the Southampton Hospital, so we will use the support of Stony Brook, yeah. um, nursing staff, and some of the cardiologists to help us out to build this program. I know one of the efforts underway currently is development of all the protocols and the policies, the procedures, mm -hmm. and all of the steps that will follow. And uh, I know you both have the same goal, absolutely safety is paramount, mm -hmm. and that we will utilize the same procedures that are utilized at, at Stony Brook and, and essentially mm -hmm. be an extension of, of Stony Brook. Um, I think our, our, our real goal is to extend the uh, the good that Stony Brook can do to the South Fork, bring it, bring it closer to home. You know, patients, patients that we treat here that can be um, safely uh, monitored and discharged from here, we will keep here right. locally where they can, you know, be home with their family. Um, but patients that need advanced care will be transferred out of uh, Southampton Hospital right. uh, to Stony Brook for whatever care that they need. Right, whether they need the open heart or even the follow-up well, care absolutely. afterwards. It will all be, all be done exactly that way. Can you talk a little bit, um, what is this plaque? I mean, I know dental plaque. What is it, what's going on inside the artery that's, that's creating this? And what's, uh, you know, we hear about lifestyle. There's so much conflicting advice, actually, about, you know, the, this gets so, to your so goal of preventive care. The plaque is, in a simple term, what we call a blockage. Okay. Um, it's, the, in a medical term, we call atherosclerotic process. So there are certain risk factors which are, um, can predispose you to atherosclerotic and plaque buildup. Some of the risk factors are modifiable risk factors and some are non-modifiable risk factors. Non-modifiable risk, risk factors like age, gender, and family history that uh, we cannot modify. But some right. of the modifiable risk factors that include smoking, high blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, diabetes. Right. So most common is um, risk factor that we talk about is smoking and hypertension. Um, ultimately, what they, uh, smoking and hypertension do is Damage, they damage is the inner lining of the coronary arteries called endothelial lining. Okay. That damage to the endothelial lining causes endothelial dysfunction. That attracts uh, cholesterol and circulating platelets, one of the components in the blood, okay. to attracts that one to the, the dysfunctional area and causes a plaque buildup. 
Okay. And this is a, a slow process. This is not even like overnight process. It takes a long time. That's um, why we see it later in later life, on, typically. Um, right. So, at the same time, mm -hmm. hypertension makes the arterial wall stiffer, right. and that causes more endothelial dysfunction. Uh, cholesterol itself, if you have a high circulating cholesterol, will cause a more plaque buildup. So eventually, this plaque will progress, progress, and it will, once you start obstructing the blood flow right. in the coronary arteries, that will be lack of circulation in the, to the heart muscle. So every time we exert, or any exertional activity or exercise, people will develop some symptoms because of the lack of circulation. That okay. includes the chest pain, a shortness of the breath. Those are the time we come up in a picture to right. see, you know, how this, what the symptoms look like, and then we decide based on the symptoms whether they need to go directly to the uh, uh, angiogram or stress testing is required. Or some of the people, chest pain is, is a very vague term, right. and. A lot of times, GI symptoms will also um, yeah, a lot of things mimic will cause the heart pain, symptoms, right? yeah. especially also in a female. They do have a lot of silent symptoms, right. and um, they don't get classical symptoms. Also, people with diabetes, they do have atypical symptoms, but those are signs of the blockages. So we, we, have, we take the detailed history, um, the symptoms, their functional capacity, exercise tolerance, and then decide that you know, where they stand in the, the whole uh, paragraph to see if they need some further testing. Right. Um, this ultimately, um, our main goal is to prevent the atherosclerotic process. Okay. And the only way we can prevent the atherosclerotic process is to modify the risk factors. That's okay. where all the different different uh, society comes up in the picture. They have their guidelines about the blood pressure management, the cholesterol management, right. and uh, diabetes, to blood pressure goal for patients with diabetes and their cholesterol goals. So we, that's where we come up in the picture. We sit with the patient, we educate them. Say, listen, these are the goals. You are diabetic, so your LDL needs to be this, you know, below this number, right. exercise. And we also do um, there's some education to the patient to see, you know, our main goal is to prevent the future cardiovascular event. Okay. And uh, special diet also is very main, uh, <clears throat> comes up in a big, big time in the picture, as we recently heard about uh, the removal of trans fat diet from New York City uh, right. diet and significantly lower numbers of cardiovascular event in last one year right. itself. Absolutely. And the same thing with smoking. Right. Smoking, I know, is a huge yeah, risk factor. Yeah, right. And you mentioned actually, uh, uh, Dr. Bench, if if you go in, you identify the blockage, you can stent it. And I think most people know what a stent is. But you also talked about the pressure monitoring. What what's what's that about? Well. And, 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 there, and there are times, can you, uh, do you ever go and find there's an issue that's not necessarily related to a plaque buildup or a blockage that may be something else triggering a pressure issue or something? Well, when we talk about pressure issues, um, we're, largely, we're largely referring to either valvular heart disease, right, where you can have either stenosis of a valve in the heart or gross insufficiency of a valve in the heart that can be causing um, uh, heart failure-like symptoms where the heart's not e expelling the blood the way that it needs to. Right. Um, we could be measuring pressures inside the lungs to diagnose pulmonary hypertension, which is a completely, I don't want to say completely separate right. issue, but something else altogether. Right. Um, so when we talk about pressure m measurements, we're talking about identifying other potential disease processes that can be producing symptoms. Okay. Um, that again may be attributable to coronary artery disease or may be attributable to something else. So okay. first and foremost, that's where we talk about the, the diagnostic catheterization being just that, is a diagnostic procedure. Right. Um, when you t on the subject of pressure monitoring, right. however, sometimes we go in and we see blockages that are sort of borderline. Um, may be obstructing blood flow, may not be obstructing blood flow. It's very tough to tell and we've developed technology that allows us to do pressure monitoring on either side of those lesions to determine whether there is a, a, a reduction in blood flow because right. of these stenosis. So again, um, we utilize a lot of different tools right. um, and some of them are visual tools and others are um, measurements of pressure uh, to allow us to make a, a decision about the appropriate treatment management. Sounds like the technology, I've heard it said, the gold standard, it really will give us a diagnostic capability we've never had mm -hmm. before out here and gives you certainly as cardiologists the ability mm -hmm. to, to see and, and understand what's going on in a way you couldn't before. And we're just about out of time, unfortunately, but can you just, 
um, either one of you, just walk me through very, very quickly what, um, what if somebody feels for whatever reason they need to have a cardiac catheterization, either they're, they've got uh, heart, uh, chest pressure or pain or, or you've made the decision it's time for them to get this, just walk me through what they should expect to see in a, in a, a cardiac catheterization procedure. Well, again, it's, first and foremost, it's always patient selection. Right. So it's going to be a process that you want somebody to, to thoroughly examine you, um, evaluate your blood work, and evaluate your appropriateness for the procedure to make right. sure you're going to be safe. And, right. and if it's determined that you're going to go through with this, what they can expect is they are going to be brought into a holding area where they're going to see either physicians, um, uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, uh, nurses, right. various other technicians. Um, they're going to be hooked up to an EKG monitoring, obviously, to keep an eye on your blood pressure as well as your heart rate and cardiac rhythm while you're uh, going through the procedure. Right. Um, because we have to have access to um, an artery in order to introduce my catheter, we will prep um, both groin areas, which means there will be a full shave as well as sterilization of both of the femoral artery sites, so just inside of your inguinal crease in your groin, mm -hmm. as well as your wrists if your physician is comfortable doing the procedure through the radial artery, as not all interventionalists are um, as comfortable Training. doing that. Right. Um, you'll be brought into a catheterization laboratory where you'll be put on a table um, and draped. Uh, Again, they will cover you with sterile material. There will be a camera that will be a mobile camera over your head. At that point in time, you're going to see other nurses and physicians in the room. Right. Um, you'll be given medication to sort of uh, calm you down as Relax an anxiolytic yeah. as Anxio well as for Everybody's analgesic always a little purposes. Nervous with Absolutely, this, but right. to also for, to take away pain. Right. You are not put asleep. It is not general anesthesia. You okay. are not intubated. It is not surgery. Okay. Um, so you will be awake for it. And that's important because right. as the camera moves around, um, your physician may ask you to look a certain way or to take a deep breath. It helps us uh, obtain images, actually. Okay. Um, so it is a little bit of an interactive procedure, but right. certainly nothing that anybody right. has to worry about doing. Right. Um, the area of access will be numbed with lidocaine, as with any right. sort of uh, invasive procedure. Right. And actually, once the catheter is introduced, for the most part, that will be the last thing that the patient feels Maybe. that's uncomfortable. Right. Because inside your arteries, you have no nerve endings, and the, the catheter will not be felt in your heart. Um, many times people watch the, the, the procedure as I'm watching the procedure right, right. Um, and ask questions, and I'll point out as much as I can to them uh, as we're going through the process. Um, typically in the setting of an acute heart attack, um, people are in a lot of distress and having chest pain, but the minute the artery is open, typically their pain goes away, goes away. and uh, they feel much better. So again, it's, it's immediately gratifying in the right circumstances. Um, it's a definitive treatment option um, right. in the right circumstances. Right. It is certainly something that can be uh, anxiety provoking. Right. Um, but again, that's something that you should take comfort, especially if your, your physician is going right. to be right at your right hand side right. the entire time. It'll be in good hands. Absolutely. So, yeah, and I'd like to thank both of you for being here for your, mm -hmm. your description. And, and frankly, I know that we'll be in good hands with your help here at Southampton Hospital. So, um, and I'd like to thank all of you for watching us today. If you have additional questions or would like to learn more about the program or would like to schedule an appointment with Drs. Bench and Patel, they are seeing patients locally out on County Road 39 and working in our Audrey and Martin Gruce Heart and Stroke Center. Um, their office phone number is 631-702-8327. They're working with the entire team of cardiologists and cardiac surgeons at Stony Brook, and I think we're very lucky to have them here working with us. Um, if you have a question or concern, would like to help navigating the healthcare system here on the uh, East End, uh, would like uh, a recommendation or referral to one of our fine physicians in any of the specialties, please feel free to call my office at 631 726 8555. Um, I'd like to thank our friends at CTV as always for producing and airing this show in Southampton and our friends at LTV for airing the show in our East Hampton communities. Thank you everyone and good health.